what I'm going to tell you about today as the slides change is it's something that all organic chemists think about quite a bit, and that's structure function relationships. And um, these are just three examples of where organic chemists apply such relationships in medicinal chemistry, selective catalysis, materials and energy. And the area that I'm going to speak about today actually will be a, a common combined energy um, talk with selective catalysis. But the, the ideas that I'm going to talk about today, what, we, what I'm going to consider are the relationships between the energetics of binding, the energetics of selectivity, and the energetics and thermodynamics and kinetics of, of material processes. Um, and the, what we think about in structure function relationships is how you take a molecule and get to the point where you're happy with the outcome. And so for binding and medicinal chemistry, this is one area that people view structure function relationships, QSAR is an example of such. Um, and where they look at binding energies of molecules to biological targets mainly, and the range of ground state effects that they evaluate are, are quite large, one to 10 kcals per, per mole. And so prediction in this field is a little bit easier, especially if you combine that with structural biology type techniques. Um, you can generally predict improvements to, to selectivity and or um, binding as a function of a change in the molecule. In catalysis, I think all of us would agree who are in the center, this is a much harder problem um, because we're often looking at selectivity outputs. This could be site selectivity, something I'll briefly mention at the end of the talk. How do you predict where a CH bond is going to cleave? Uh, this could be enantioselectivity. I will talk about that as well in the context of the center. Um, and these ranges are much lower, and we're talking about transition states, and we're actually talking about multiple transition states where we now even know who the players are in the operation, because many additives are added to these reactions. And then finally, uh, the area that I actually will use as a case study to explain our methodology briefly is, is materials and energy. And this is, this is a pretty fun area because you're looking at both thermodynamics and kinetic properties simultaneously. And I will talk to you briefly about a battery, um, a battery project that is, is not part of the center, but I thought it would be a great way to teach you guys how our techniques work. So the question that comes up, and the one that I'll um, express on the next set of slides, is how does one use modern data tools um, to, um, to figure out structure function relationships? And we've been working on this on and off for nearly a decade. Um, and I will kind of express this, this next set of slides uh, in our most modern iteration of this. And uh, that is what we think about is everyone who does optimization in, in the laboratory is going to have an empirical set of data. And so you take some sort of structure, it could be substrate, catalyst, um, it could be a material, and you make general modifications to that structure and you see what happens, and then you intuitively start building a, a, a data set. And so our, our hypothesis or mantra, I guess is the more correct term, is that when we do such a campaign, an optimization campaign, which is what we all do in our laboratories, every single experiment you run is a physical organic experiment. And that is, if your output is site selectivity or yield, or in anti-selectivity, each one of those data points, whether it be good or bad, is important for understanding how you can both optimize and then also hopefully understand what the, what in the world's going on in the reaction. So to take this step, a step further, next slide please, one has to consider what types of structural characteristics are important for understanding and hopefully correlating your outputs, your empiricisms, to, um, to your um, uh, structure. So when we think about this, and this is the area that I think my group has spent the vast majority of its effort in the last uh, half decade or so, is how do you find parameters that both have physical meaning and are easy to, easy to measure and are something that you can hopefully interpret at the end of the day. And these are obviously sometimes complex, um, but nonetheless important. So there could be a variety of parameters, and I'll show you on a, a few slides later, a couple of the ones that we like to use that we, we are, are going to um, interrogate. Next slide, please. The next step, which I have no time to talk about today, is one that uh, my group also has been putting much effort in the last few years, and that is to use much more modern data analysis tools, machine learning, um, organizational plots. And uh, we have a, a few people in house that are now writing our own scripts, so the organic chemist can do math. Uh, Donna's online, so she would agree with this. So we're writing our own code to try to help us uh, interrogate both the parameter space as well as the output space to uh, build much better models and understand where the parameters are actually coming from. How are they interrelated? But I won't have time to speak about that today. And then finally, the main game, which is the next slide, 
is you have to do um, mathematical correlations of the outputs of interest to your characteristics. And you can do this using rather simple scripts uh, through MATLAB is what we use, but there are much more um, extravagant ones, and we've built a few ourselves, but there are extravagant ones that people use in big data analysis, and we, we have borrowed from them. I won't go in again into that kind of detail today. And then finally, on the next slide, is the question I think that we all care about in the end. It's great if you can predict, which is the goal of the relationships initially, and that is for an optimization campaign, but the ultimate outcome is what do the parameters mean, what do the equations mean, and how do they inform us to design and or interpret the outcomes we see. And so in site selective CH functionalization, what are the rules? And that is the goal of um, part of my program in the, in the center. So within this discussion today, what I'm going to do is do, again, a short case study on a material science application or an energy application. And then, because it's a simple one, and then I'll finish with snippets from the work we've done within the center and where we're going within the center um, to get, so everyone can get a sense of that. So the next slide shows you some of our standard parameter space that we start with. Um, and what we often do is we will compute using uh, classic quantum mechanic type uh, calculations, um, DFT, and we will then minimize um, structure, sometimes do conformational searches, depending depending on the types of compounds we're looking at. And then we will, um, when the next slide comes out, we'll define a number of parameters. Um, some of these are going to be classic steric in origin type parameters. Some of these are going to be more electronically driven parameters. So the steric parameters on the left-hand side are ones that we really like are sterile parameters, very easy to interpret. They uh, have three basic um, pieces, one is the length, one is the cross-sectional minimal radius, and, and the other one is the cross-sectional maximum radius. We use these for quite a bit. The other people have used these previously in the field as well as uh, more recently. Torsion angles, distances, cone angles, varied volume, you name it. We do a lot of designer parameters, which you'll see on the next few slides after these. And then finally, we look at, um, again, MBO, uh, other types of pointing charges, whoops, and it doesn't matter, you can go ahead. Uh, hybrid parameters, uh, including uh, computed IR uh, frequencies and intensities, these are more hard to interpret, uh, but we are working on that very, di uh, very diligently to understand this. And more recently, we've been looking at uh, uh, NMR tensors, um, which is a really exciting uh, field with our friends in Switzerland and the Copa Lab. All right, so the short story I'm gonna tell you, which is not related to CH functionalization, I think gives you a sense of the types of tools that we are working on is related to flow batteries. And I like this story because it tells you that what kind of, uh, what, what chemists can go with a variety of, um, when they have a new tool set. And I knew nothing about a flow battery a year and a half ago, absolutely nothing. And I, my, my colleagues who work on this still will tell me I know very little. But basically the way a flow battery works is you take a renewable resource, um, this could be uh, light or wind energy, you, you um, you use that energy to um, charge a molecule, and you'll notice the charge and just uh, charge molecules on the top uh, are either analyte to cathlites, so um, anodes and cathodes, um, and so you can see they're highly reactive species. And you store these highly reactive species in tanks. This is the exciting part about a flow battery, and it can be done in non-aqueous solvents, which also expands the the energy range by which you can store it because uh, you don't have to worry about water oxidation. And then you reflow this charged species across an electrode uh, to disperse the energy as a function of when the energy is not coming in. But if you look at this from a, you know, kind of a 10,000 foot view, all you're looking at is structure function relationships of organic molecules. So what we need is stable and charged and discharged forms. But we also need to store a significant amount of energy. And I love this, this problem because what you have to have is a highly reactive compound that's stable. So it's the conundrum of an organic chemist all the time. You want a highly reactive catalyst, but you want it to be stable to turnover. Same concept. So on the next slide, the story begins when we were recruited to work with a team. It turns out a team of people that are I'm quite close with already, the Sanford Lab at Michigan, to work on their molecules here. So this is the, <coughs> the prototypical molecule that they looked at. And first of all, it has low potential. So for those of you not familiar with volts and more familiar with kcals per mole, one volt is <coughs> 23 kcals per mole. And it's, um, 
So 0.1 volts is a very meaningful number in the field of energy and also in the field of redox chemistry. What was nice about these molecules, if you can look at them very quickly, is that they're um, relatively modular, reversible um, electrochemistry. And on the next slide is the problem. So when we came onto the team, what you see here is if you charge and discharge these, so if you think about a battery, what you do is charge and discharge a molecule. You see that these things have incredible um, capacity loss as a function of, of charge and discharge cycles. So on the next slide, I'll show you how we actually do our science, where we first establish a training set. And this is true with any collaboration we're involved in or any in-house um, work we do. And basically what we do for a training set is you design a, a variety of molecules that you can easily make. That's number one. And this is a really easy one to look at because you can see it's a Hammett series, basically, at the top of the arrowing ring. And then we measure um, a variety of decomposition rates and the electrochemical potential. And now the really important piece of information for you all here in terms of how you use this is you actually need to have molecules that are terrible. So convincing a collaborator either to build a bad catalyst or a bad substrate or a bad electrolyte here, that's not easy to do until you show them that this actually works for them. But that's something you have to convince them to do. So if you look at this, um, KREL is the relative rate of decomp, larger number, faster decomp. You can see you decompose this um, as a function of um, uh, as a function of uh, redox potential. That what I mean by that is E one half goes from negative one point one three to negative one point oh three, and the decomp rate uh, go is improved by an uh, order of magnitude. So they're correlated. So what does that mean? As you become more stable, it's less reactive. However, if you look at the end substituents, and this is where it gets interesting. Next slide, please. You can see there's this interesting um, group of compounds where it's a medchem group. And again, you see some catalysis a lot. Ethyl, isopropyl, T-butyl. You see a, a significant change in KREL. Again, uh, almost two orders of magnitude here. And you see E1 half remains constant. So this suggests that this, the stuff on the nitrogen, the substituent on the nitrogen, may be important for solving the problem. Um, and it's not something you maybe would have expected, um, per se, because you draw the radical as drawn there, because that's where the electron density should be. But you obviously have a resonance form by which the radical is next to the nitrogen, and maybe that is the decomposition pathway, and that was the hypothesis we put forth. But what we did next is just do statistical modeling. So next slide, please. We took... Um, a variety of those parameters I described before, we tried to do correlations and we failed. And so I'm, again, I think there's a great example of the types of things we do. And we do this with all of our collaborators. Our four collaborators have to do, see us do this iteratively 10 to 100 times before we get a model that we are satisfied with. Um, but we could get no models that were predictive. So what we did next is hypothesize that we, there was another parameter that we weren't understanding. And if you go to the next um, panel, please. You'll see that um, the equation at the bottom is the one we uh, get to work, and it has this parameter, h, high outer plane of the periodic ring. Basically, it's like a buried volume. And what this allowed us to do is have an equation where you can take the computed E1 half and the high outer plane, and this correlates very well to the, to the data if you put up the next um, panel, please. And you get uh, great statistics and such. I won't go through all that detail today. What's important to note is E1 half is a thermodynamic property. It's fundamental. And you can even consider it an electronic property in a kind of um, a primitive way. HST, or the high outer plane, is a steric property, obviously. It's a size thing. But I think what we're seeing here is it's kinetic uh, involvement in basically slowing down the decomp path, which we think is a dimerization. So what's exciting about this equation, and again, why I chose this case study, is you kind of separate the renowned hysterics. And that means you presumably can try to optimize these either independently or concurrently to get a molecule that you care about. So when we do these types of correlations, the first things we do is we interpolate. So next slide, please. So we predict a couple molecules that are in, within range of the data set. This is always the way to find out if your model's robust, because um, you've extrapolation you can often fail, and you don't know if it's a model problem or something else. So what we find here is these interpolate very well. And so the next stage is we try to get to what is that target area. So going from days of half-life to months of half-life. So the next slide, please. And you can see on this next slide, when it comes up, 
that we can do this. And we actually predict incredibly well, a less than 5% error, uh, extrapolative error, and it's a thousand fold increase in stability. Um, we go from, uh, it's basically about three to four kcals per mole. And this is something in catalysis, at least in my experience so far, we haven't been able to ascertain. We can do about one kcal per mole in really well-behaved systems, but three is pretty impressive extrapolation. And it's not a surprise, you make that substituent much bigger, um, but the model really nicely um, comprehends this. Next slide, please. The rub is on the next slide, and this is always the rub. And that is, if you look at all the data points here, the blue dot and the orange dot are generally in the same trend line as the ones that we, um, so the blue dot's where we started, the, the red dot's where we got to. And what happens here is you're correlating redox potential to E1 half. That's good if you care about the half-life. It's not good if you care about energy density. So where we need to go is the blue space. And so this led us to another virtual screen. Um, next slide, please. And through the virtual screen, what we predicted was this molecule here. So you make the molecule more electron rich, and that will increase the voltage, 1.23 volts. So it's a significant actual extrapolation there. And we predict this is going to be stable, not quite as stable as the one I showed you, but pretty stable. And so we make this molecule. And on the next slide, you'll see that we predict the outcome perfectly. Um, it has relatively good KREL. Um, it has really high um, voltage. And this is actually the template for the, one, the molecules that we're putting into batteries as we speak. Now, the most interesting piece of data on this slide to me, and I think all of you guys who are involved in catalysis would, would agree, is the methyl ethyl business. Methyl ethyl sometimes has no effect and sometimes has more profound effects. And that's a, I think that tells you all we need to know about chemistry is we can't guess sometimes how these work. In this particular case, you get a two, uh, a, you get two orders of magnitude loss in KREL. Um, no change in E1 half is a function of an ethyl to a methyl. And all this is suggesting is the steric parameter that we, we ascertain in our modeling um, that the ethyl group is geared up out of the plane of the ring, whereas the methyl group is not. So you're blocking this, this secondary decomposition chemistry. So next slide, please. Okay, so I, will, I won't spend any more time on this. What I want to do is finish this with a few snippets of the things we've been doing in CCAHF with these tools. I would have talked about these case studies, but they are more complicated. And I think that's a point uh, to this whole field is that catalysis brings in complications of substrate, reagent, and catalyst structure. So on the next slide, when it shows, you'll see two collaborations we published on previously, one with the Dubois lab in the top and one with the Davis lab on the bottom, both of them asking very similar questions. And that is, how do you control site selectivity of a CH functionalization? The top is an amination with the Dubois lab, where we looked at the, the function of the R group on the sulfamate ester and the R prime group on the substrate, and we get, uh, we lost some characters here. Those are supposed to be sigma plus. We see that the substrate sigma plus value is correlated. And then we see the um, sulfamate CO stretch, which is kind of depicted here. We got macified, Dan, CO stretch here. And then an intensity of the um, OSN stretch. These are complicated, uh, uh, complicated parameters. And this is something that we've been trying to deal with over the years. But nonetheless, you can correlate both substrate and reagent in this particular example. And we start getting models that allow us to predict better, better um, examples of this. And in this case, we were able to enhance the selectivity rather significantly in a, a number of cases. In the bottom study, um, this is done with a uh, um, use group, we looked at a very similar question. How do you differentiate a methyl versus a methine? Uh, and these are benzylic sites. Um, and we looked at uh, two different rhodium catalysts. And these are, I think, these are important examples of old school rhodium catalysts and new school rhodium catalysts, and the ones that um, that use a group is taking quite advantage of. And in this case, we only have two parameters that are important here. One is the point charge on the CH of the carbon next to the methine. And the other one is the stretching frequency of the uh, reagent, in this case, the, in the diazo compound. 
um, or structuring intensity. And so again, you can see these are relatively complicated parameters, but they're incredibly predictive. So if, if you want to use this in synthesis, you have a way to predict how different variations on the substrate and on the diazo compound could have an effect. On the next slide, I'll show you four um, projects that are ongoing and very briefly describe them. The first one is one that doesn't look like parameterization is important, but I'll briefly mention why it is. So this is a, a long-term project between Justin's group and my group and, and, and our teams. And we've been trying to come up with catalysts that could uh, really harness uh, a mean and basic functionality in, um, in substrates. And this is a, a really an eye towards the Novartis library that some of us are familiar with within the center. Um, and we were able to accomplish this with a RU, uh, RU BIPI uh, derivative. And what we want to be able to do is then use this, the BIPIs themselves as a way to um, correlate structure to function and reactivity in this case. We also hope to be able to correlate site selectivity with these types of systems. The second one, which is in the top right, is one that's nearly ready for publication. Poor Mo and I have gone back and forth. I think we're on draft number 40, because uh, Mo and I are both really anal retentive, it turns out. Uh, but this is a really neat study. We're trying to understand how to predict which substrates will undergo a permanganate oxidation, the system that Mo developed many years ago. And we use this Hydantuin um, model system that you can see on the sides. And what we were able to do is ascertain which ones will go versus which one will not using the training set of Hydantuins and apply that to the more complex species. It's nearly ready for submission. So I didn't give away any of the really salient details, but I think it's a very cool study. Um, we've also done a study in the bottom corner. Uh, this is mainly with um, Jin Kwan Yu's group, but I want to uh, make a call out to Yansu Park, who came through uh, KAIST as an exchange student. This is all enabled by the CCHF. And what we've been trying to do here is understand structure function relationships of um, Jin's amazing amino acid ligands in the CH functionalizations. And we have a very nice set of data at this stage, and, um, and this is in review at, the at this time. And finally, uh, I mean, I'm, just tr I'm trying to preach, I guess, what you would preach here. The CCHF has also allowed me to interact with people I did not, uh, do not interact with quite often and through the center meetings and, 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 these, and these online chats. And this is through the, uh, the group at Novartis. And uh, Kian Tan and I started talking about this, I think, nearly three or four years ago. And uh, what evolved here was a, it was actually supposed to be a CH functionalization project. But we got uh, tempted by a, a reaction that you see here, which is a, a, a selective um, oxidative addition of either a bromide or a chloride on a pyridine. And through uh, a number of uh, uh, steps and using some of our tools, uh, we were able to take a system that was one to one at the best through an empirical screen and get it to be 315 to one um, to selectively do the CLC bond. Um, and this was very much enabled by the CCHF. So with that, I will complete the mission and go to the acknowledgement, acknowledgement, <laughs> acknowledgement slides. Um, I, I, want, I hopefully pointed out everyone's name on the slides and my current group, I wanna thank them and former group members who've worked on these projects. Um, I have an awesome group of people like most people do in this business. Uh, I really wanna make a shout out to my collaborators. I talked about a lot of people's work in a short time um, and it's been a pleasure working in the CCHF, especially especially because the playground for our tools, site selectivity and enantio selectivity are really on target with the types of goals that we have. And I am really excited with the number of programs that we have going forward. And I want to thank the center for funding as well as the other funding agencies who have been involved in this. And I'd be happy to answer any questions as long as they're not hard. Thank you.